does Midrash Bereshit mean? Anybody remember me explaining that? Midrash is just their commentary. Bereshit is what they call the book of Genesis. What the Jews do is they name their books after the first word that appears in it. So we name it after the Septuagint, the Greek translation. So we call it Genesis. Okay? And Exodus. But that's not the way they do it. They look at it and say, oh, Bereshit, that's the first word. So when you say Bereshit to a Jew, they would think, they would think of the book of Genesis. Anyways, <clears throat> let's look at the Bereshit prophecy, okay? So, this is going to be amazing. Of course, in the Hebrew, you go from right to left. That's the Hebrew. Now, let's look at the Paleo Hebrew on this, okay? Now, for underneath here, I'm going to put the Paleo. That's a tent right there. And in fact, Bet means what? The letter itself means Bet when you say Bet Lachem house. It means house. And here's a tent floor plan, so that's a house. And then Resh, Resh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah, head. And there's some teeth. And then here's my favorite one, is <laughs> which is an arm or a hand. And then the top is a cross. It kind of ends in a cross. So you probably know where I'm going <clears throat> with this. <clears throat> so this is a house. Represents a house. Okay. The Resh is a head. It not only means actual physical head, but it could be a prince, the head, the one who's in charge. Okay, the king, the prince. Okay, either one. And then the rest, these are teeth. And they grind and they crush. Okay, they could, they could grind and crush something. And then this is an arm or a hand, the yud, which is an um, arm or hand. And this is a deed, it speaks of a deed or work that needs to be done. And then the Tav is a sign. It means sign, okay? And pictorially, it's a cross. So Jesus said to the Jews, when they said, show us a sign. Of course, they had all kinds of signs in the book of Isaiah, the lame walk, the blind saw, and all that. He said, no sign should be given you except for the what sign of Jonah sign of Jonah, Jonah. which is Jonah as well. he was three days and three nights in the belt so it starts with the cross of so the sign that he gave them was the same sign that was a paleo Hebrew sign which is the cross which started started the sign of Jonah okay so we have all that now <clears throat> let's see how we can go through this, okay, and find out what it is. Now, just let's just look at the passage in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. All right. Um, and that first word is about a sheet, borrow, and a elohim. And then you have a et if you transliterated it, which is kind of funny, et. Elohim, or God, created the heavens and earth. Now, that E-T in the Hebrew is an untranslated word. It's right there in the middle of the verse. This will give us our first clue, okay? And that word E-T is just a punctual marker. It just tells you where the direct object is. And they write it actually as in the sentence. So it's, um, um, it looks like this. Aleph, and then you have a Tav. Looks like that. So it says, in the beginning, God, Aleph, Tav, created the heavens and the earth. What does that mean? The Aleph, that's like saying the first letter and the last letter. And so in the Greek, they actually use it in Revelation 1 8. I am the. Alpha and the Omega. Yeah. The Alpha 
and the omega, right? The alpha and the omega. And so, what it says in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God, the alpha and the omega, created the heavens and the earth. And it says in Revelation, and I believe in the book of Colossians, it says this, Colossians 1.16, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and on earth. He talked about in the beginning he created the heavens and the earth. He created all things, visible and invisible, whether by, be they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. So it even tells us in Genesis 1.1 1, 1, who that creator was the Alpha and the Omega. So we start seeing clues that there might be more to that verse than what we normally see, okay? And of course, 1.8 says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, and this is one in Revelation 1.7 that returns on the clouds for everyone to see, which is obviously Yeshua or Jesus. <clears throat> so he calls himself the Alpha and the Omega, and he does two other times at the end of the book of Revelation. So if Jesus is actually embedded in Genesis 1.1. Is he embedded in it in other ways? And the answer to that is absolutely. So if you look on the back of that handout, Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, Remember the former things of old, for I am God. There is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. Listen carefully. Let's take this literally, declaring the end from when? From the beginning, the Rashid. Be'er Rashid is in beginning. Rashid right there, that's the Hebrew there, is beginning. From the beginning and from ancient times, things that are not yet done. So he says he's going to declare the very end of everything from the very Rashid. The very beginning and where does the very beginning begin genesis 1 1. so we're going to look in there okay and see what we can see now matthew okay 5 18 says this for verily i say unto you to heaven and earth pass away one jot or one tittle shall no wise pass from the law until all be fulfilled in other words every little marking in these letters aren't going to pass away because everything is important i mean what the jews do is they they look at that first letter bet right there they say well notice it's opened in and here this is where eternity was and it's closed ended we don't know anything about this but the rest of this is open and they go into long explanations and i'm not so sure that they're not right that and they have this quaint saying which i have a film bill might know that missler like quoting the rabbi saying when jesus comes he will not only explain the scriptures he will not only explain the words he's going to explain the spaces in between the letters and i'm not so sure that's not true okay i'm sure he'll start off right here and says oh didn't you know the whole gospel is just in that first letter it's like okay yes Oh, did I? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Bet, Rish. Uh, oh, 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 Aleph. Yes, thank you. So right, I was about to say, I thought I had an Aleph there, and I, I did. Okay, that goes like right here and right here. And then that is an ox head. It's like Bullwinkle or something. And that is, of course, number one, the first and all that. Okay, so now we kind of get an idea of, of the letters right there. Reshit, Bereshit, okay? Now, we're going to start looking at this and breaking it down and see where we get, all right? So I'm going to erase some of this. And let's look at the first point. Where does it start? It starts with Bet, a house. So we're talking about a house. All right. There's a house there. Here's a logical question, which is, 
Who is in the house? Okay. Did you know that right here, the first two letters? Remember, they add later on in the original Hebrew, they did not have the vowel markings. It's B-R, which spells bar, Simon, bar Jonah, bar mitzvah, barn nubis, yes, son of encouragement. So bar means son. So the first Paleo Hebrew thing is the house. The second thing is it spells, this is in the pictograph, okay, in the Paleo Hebrew, we're going to say is a house. Then you come, who's in the house? Well, it's a son, it's a bar. That's in the spelling, okay? So now we know a son is in the house, okay? Now, we go to the next letter, resh. It's a head, okay? A prince, a king. So the son is a king, a prince, all right? As we go through that, it's like, okay, that's interesting. Now, it's going to get really interesting, okay? Now, but he's a son, so we have a son in the house, a son that's a king in the house. But if he's a son, who is he, who is he the son of? That's the next question, okay? Or, okay, son, son of who? Well, what's the very next letter? It is the Aleph. That's the first letter in the word which appears in this verse, Elohim. And to the Jews, that can represent God, the Aleph. Plus, it's a strong ox. It means the head. Okay? It means the strong leader. All right? So, we have... He is, he, he's, no, it, it, in, 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 in the beginning, God created, God is Elohim. In, in the actual passage, which is spelt with Aleph to start it all. And they use that as a marker for God. It, okay, it's the first letter. All right. So if you say whose his son is, he's the son of Aleph. Or, he's the son of God. He's the son of Elohim. So we start to find out more as we go through that. All right. So now the person who's in the house is a son. He's a king. And he's the son of God. All by just going through this first part right here. That a sheet. So we're going to progress on. And we're going to find some really surprising things. Okay. Now, let's go to point number five, okay? Uh, this son is, now if you look right here, once we get, um, if you go B, R, right there, B, R, and then the LF is A, that spells bara, okay, which means to create our creator. So this son is the son of God. He's also the creator. All right. So we obviously know who this is. Okay. Now, something weird happens here. Point number six. Is everybody up with me? As we progress through this at a spelling level, and a Paleo Hebrew letter uh, level. I also have a handout that will explain all this when I'm done, just so you know. But I want you to listen up for now. If you look at the very word itself, I wish I'd put that in at the beginning, right there. Okay. If you look right here, right there, at the second, third, and fourth letters, you know what that spells? That spells resh. We just had resh because that told us 
that a head or a prince or a king was in the house. Now we have it spelled out. Why is it repeated? That's a good question. Why is it repeated? And look at the progression where it's going. It's going from the house, the way the Hebrew runs. Resh goes this way. It's spelled out now because it's going towards something, towards the end of that word. Everybody understand that? It's going from being a son in the house. Now he's leaving the house. Oh, and he's, he's spelt out. He becomes the word. In the beginning was the word. And the word became flesh because he left the house. Get it? We call it the logos. So that means word. So now that it's spelt out in a word and is progressing from heaven, his father's house, to the earth and to a certain work he has to do. Does that make sense? Okay, so it's like, wow, that's kind of interesting. So now let's find out exactly what that work is, okay? Why did he leave the house? Now, here's Resh, and right at the end of Resh are teeth. Here's the work he's going to do. It's teeth that grind and crush. So he is going to either grind and crush something or be ground and crushed. The sun is heading towards that. All right. Now, what garden was he in, Jesus, before his crucifixion? Gethsemane. What does that mean? The olive press to bring forth the anointing oil, the Holy Spirit. He was being crushed and pressed in there. He is sweating like great drops of blood. Okay? So he's coming down. And sheen is also the one letter that is used to designate God, too. On the mezuzah. Remember those little tubes that Jews hang outside their door? The mezuzah just means gatepost. I actually have some in my house, around my house, on my front door, you know, on different doorways and stuff. And then they have like a little scroll in there. Usually it's Deuteronomy like 6, 4, and 5, which is Shema uh, Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai. It's actually Yehovah Eloheinu. Not only you know, because it's right here on my three bracelets, which I wore for... And when I ordered that, it's funny, I don't think you can get it now. It didn't say Adonai, it said Yehovah, which would be a big no no. <laughs> but it has the YHVH, not Adonai. So, anyways, so it's showing the sun coming out and he's being crushed. And that crush is the same letter for God. So, God, the sun, is being crushed. Okay, that's what he's working towards. Now, as he's being crushed in the garden, it's the yud, which is a hand or an arm. It speaks of a work or a deed, okay, that has to be accomplished. And what do you think that work or deed is? The tav, the cross, the cross. All that in the first word in the Bible. That's pretty amazing. So we'll put it all together. The son, who is a head person, a prince in the house, okay, his home, he's in his home in heaven. He is the creator. He is God. He is the son of God. He is leaving to accomplish salvation by being crushed and by being crucified on a cross. So Genesis 3.15 says he's going to stomp on the head of the serpent, but the serpent's going to bruise his heel. So he's both crushing and being crushed at the same time. So it tells the whole gospel story right there. Right there. Of course, it's easy. It's, well, it's hard even after we know the facts to go back and, you know, extract that. But that's what people have been able to do. Is it creating some kind of new doctrine where I'm going off the... Deep end? No. Nope. No, it's not creating some new doctrine. 
It just shows you the level and depth of God's Word, which is um, pretty amazing. So now we are going to get into the timestamps. So everybody's got that gospel message in the very first word in the gospel, that a sheet. Okay? And you have to get it by looking at the actual Hebrew word with spelling. Then you got to go to the Paleo Hebrew. Bare sheet. Now we know the story again, okay? We have a house, and then there is a bar, right? A, a, um, a son, is that correct? Okay, so I could do better than that. Okay, and then there's the resh. The resh is the hardest one for me to draw on the paper. It's a head looking up. Okay, and then the aleph, I, that's bullwinkle right there. And, and then the sheen, which is some teeth crushing. And then the yud, which is a hand. About to, and then the tav. Okay, so, so it's in the house is the bar is a son. Okay, and he's the son of aleph, which is God right there. And then we see Resh right here because he's the becomes the word and he's progressing this way. All right. And then once he does, well, he's going to be crushed. Okay. And he's going to crush. He's going to crush Satan's kingdom and he's going to be crushed for our sins. And he's going towards a deed, a work right here. It's the cross. Now let's look at timestamps and we'll come up with the exact date of the rapture. Okay. Well. Do you guys, should I do it or not? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Time stamps. So now we're going to look at it on another level. I can't take all three levels together. You really get confused like I did. Okay. Matria, right? What's that? Gematria or Gematria. What is that? And it's a valid thing. It's in Revelation 13, 18, right? The number, the, the number of his name. The mark of the beast, right? It's the number of a man. It's the number of his name, which is 666. That's Gamatria. In other words, his name adds up to 666. It's like if you took A, that'd be 1. B would be 2, all the way up to 9. Then you have 10, then 20, then 30, then 40. Okay? Remember Gamatria. Each of the Hebrew letters is assigned a value. All right? So now, let's take a look at what we have. So in Gamatria, as we go through the story, I'm going to put the value down here. That's 10. And I learned a lot about Gamatria through this. It's not just adding things up. There's different ways you can use this. Okay, there we go. So like Tav, the last letter is 400. Aleph, Bet, Alpha, Beta, Alpha, Bet. Bet is the second letter, so it's a sign two. Okay, now here's what we're gonna see. This sheen right here is like I say, the one letter designation for God. You see it on the mezuzah and stuff because it stands for El Shaddai. Shaddai, which is the sheen starts Shaddai. El is God. It's God Almighty. Actually, that's not a very good translation, but so the sheen is the one thing. It's the number 300, which is three is divine perfection. So it's magnified a hundred times. So it's divine perfection magnified. Okay. It's used in connection with people like Enoch. He had 300 men, right? Noah, uh, Joseph, Gideon, Samson, David, to signify victory over the enemy and bloodshed. Okay? They represent a supernatural victory over death. 300 does. All right? So kind of get that in your mind. Now, let's look at the timestamps on here. Right here, the Yud and the top. See, I would have said 410. He's calling the Yod the divine multiplier. What's 10 times 400? 4,000. That's 4,000. Okay. So it's showing 
right here, the sun progressing to here to do his divine work right there. And from the creation to the cross was how long? 4,000 years. 4, years. For him to go from the beginning to finally the divine work he had accomplished was 4,000 years. Okay, that's kind of interesting. The third, fourth, and fifth letters. So now we have the Aleph, one, okay, and then we have the Sheen, which is 300, okay, and then we have the, uh, what's next, the Yud. So, one, 301. Let's see what I came out with. When you have the Aleph and the Sheen together, these two letters, that spells, um, that spells the word fire. It's speaking something about fire. Okay. It's the word esh. All right. Esh. It speaks of fire. Now, if we get those three letters, it's asking, when is this fire scheduled? When is this fire going to happen? All right. Because we're looking at those letters which spell fire and they come out to 10. 301, all right? Now, 1, so if you do 300 times 10 times 3, okay, 10 times 300 times 1 equals what? 3,000. 3, now, so there's some kind of fire after 3,000 years. We've already done the 4,000 years to the cross. If you go 3,000 years past the cross, what do you come up with? 3,000. No. 3,000 years, 2,000 years for the church age, 1,000 years for the millennial kingdom. It's the end of the millennial kingdom where Peter says the heavens and the earth are going to melt in intense heat. Everything's going to be destroyed by fire. fire. And then you have the new heavens and the new earth. Get it? So that's Revelation 21. So coincidentally, where it spells fire, and you take these letters and do the gametria is 3,000, and we've already talked about 4,000 years from the beginning to the cross is where he accomplishes his deed. Then 3,000 years past that is the ash or the fire, and that's the new heavens and the new earth. Wow. That is really interesting. Okay, it says this in Revelation um, 20, 11 through 15. I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose face the earth and heavens fled away, and there's no place found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things written in the books according to their work. Okay, and then it talks about the death and casting into the lake of fire and all that. So there's also at the end of the thousand year period, people being cast into what? The lake of Esh. At the end of that 3000 year period. Now we have another timestamp in here. Okay. And that's the second and fifth letters. Okay. So the second one is the Resh. And the fifth one is one, two, three, four, five. The Yud. Okay. So that's 10 times a 200. That's equal 2,000. Okay. And so if you take, if you take 2,000 years from his work on the cross, exactly 2,000 years, and if I'm correct, it's 30 AD. What do you come out to? 20, 30. And then where do you get the rapture? Minus seven years. Which brings us to where? 2023, possibly. Could be. Like I say, the two big candidates for me personally is this year and 2025. I see 30 or 32 AD is the most likely candidate that he was crucified, you know, during that time, okay? 
Now, so all these timestamps in there, and to end all this, to end all this, there are seven new beginnings all in this prophecy. Seven, isn't that coincidental? Seven new beginnings. You wouldn't have eight new beginnings because eight means new beginning. Yeah. It's a completeness of new beginnings. Okay. Now, who can think of some of them? Okay. Well, from one, we talked about from um, the beginning of the universe. Creation, right? So that, that would be a new beginning. And then number two, we talked about, um, and I, I didn't actually get into this part. What this guy does, he marks the 2,000-year period to, from the cross, not from creation but from the fall of Adam. And he said, well, Jesus was 33 and a half years old when he was crucified. He had three and a half year of ministry. Oh, isn't that coincidental? The Christ has a three and a half year ministry. The Antichrist has a three and a half year ministry. Exactly. So Christ got his work done and accomplished redemption for mankind in that three and a half years. Where Antichrist, in a way, gets his done. He accomplishes destruction and total annihilation. Anyways, so from creation, and then we have the uh, fall, which was a new beginning. Not a good one, okay? Then we have from the cross on. That was a new beginning. And then we have number four, okay? We have the rapture, which is the completion of that. Then we have number five. Then we go up to the trib. And then number six, you can draw this out of the better sheet, okay? Then we have the second coming. And then number seven, we have 30, 30 AD, which is the 3,000-year period, which is the new heavens and the new earth, okay? All in the better sheet prophecy, okay? So he will tell us the beginning he will tell uh, the end from starting at the beginning, the Rashid. Then we go to the very beginning, Be Rashid, in beginning, okay? So the next one after this one I will do next time is the Akarit prophecy. You know what Akarit means? End. <laughs> he's going to tell us the end, and he's gonna, we're going to take that Hebrew word, and we're going to decode that one, and it tells a story, okay? All this just in a word or two. Isn't that amazing? I mean, to me it is. Absolutely amazing. And so things are being revealed now that had never been revealed. But things like there being like a 6,000, like the church lasting 2,000 years, about 2,000 years, and about there being a millennial kingdom, everybody wrote about that early on. Like the Essenes, they break it up into three 2,000-year periods, which makes sense. It makes perfect sense because you got from Adam to Abraham and from Abraham and to Jesus. That's 4,000 years from Jesus until, you know, he comes again. And then you got a 1,000-year period. They always made it 6,000 years and then a 1,000-year period. And they all based it upon Genesis 1. They all saw the same thing. Six days, man labors. Six 1,000 years, man labors. The seventh day man rests. The seventh 1,000 year is a rest, the millennial kingdom. They all saw that. Okay? And like I say, it kills me because today we explain that away in most denominations. And we miss what's going to happen.